In this episode of Ham Nation, Ray Novak from Icom America visits us with a sneak peek of some new products shown last week at Tokyo Ham Fair. And we've got the Ham Radio Newsline News with Don Wilbanks, uh, Dr. T with the solar update, and viewer videos. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, number 365 for August 29th, 2018. Ray's Sneak Peek. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Ham Nation. I'm George W5JDX. Bob Heil is not with us tonight. He is traveling to Hawaii. I think he's going to try to set up maybe a 10 gig contact with Gordo back in the main. <laughs> uh, may, maybe not. I don't know if that will work out or not. But let's go around real quick, say hello to everyone. Uh, first, right down to my south there is Don Wilbanks. Hi, Don. Hey, hello, George. How are you? We're we're uh, we're celebrating something today, and then we're not celebrating something today. We're remembering something today. So first, a celebration. We're celebrating Sarah Hiles' birthday, Bob's better half. So happy birthday to Sarah. Uh, yes, they're in Hawaii right now. So that's swanky, and we're remembering uh, with uh, some. Uh, uh, some trepidation for some of us anyway, a little PTSD and some uh, melancholy. The 13th uh, anniversary of Hurricane Katrina landfall today. So it's changed my life and uh, the lives of a lot of other people down here in the Gulf South. We've got a good solar update with Dr. T, and she wanted me to remind you that uh, the one you're going to hear tonight is kind of an abbreviated version. There's a whole lot more that uh, you'll find in her Twitter feed, so watch for that. But we've got solar update from Dr. T and Newsline, and uh, we've just got a bunch of stuff. We've got Ray Novak and everybody here tonight, right, uh, George? Yeah, we do. We sure do. And we've got Gordo over there on the left coast. Uh, Gordo, what is going on with you this week? Well, tonight we're going to be talking about meters, and we're going to be talking about coax cable and things that coax cable would never uh, do, but did, as we'll explain. Um, Shelby, boy, that's the place to be this weekend. Shelby Ham Fest, uh, August 31, September 1. Be there or be square. And finally, uh, working Hawaii on 10 gigs. No, nope. um, no one's done it yet. And last week when we talked about 10 gigs, uh, remember also DEMI, Down East Microwave, makes some great 10 gig products all assembled even in the box all you need to do is to add your external lo rig so down east microwave or demi for more 10 gig neat stuff george back to you okay gordo uh we'll be looking forward to seeing your short shots here shortly and uh over to my west also but not quite as far as ray novak from ICOM America. Hi, Ray. How are you tonight? Hey, George, and hello, everybody in Ham Nation. Glad to be here today. So we've got something to talk about. I, I know there was just a big ham fest over in Tokyo, and you didn't go this year, did you? But you got some um, a little background on what happened there? Yes, sir, I did. There's been a lot of interesting videos, photos, as well as some of my friends at work at ICOM that have shared information with me on what they were showing there. There's a lot of new technology, uh, but also this, the much-anticipated SET 9700 was debuted there. Oh, so wow. that, that, what can you tell us about that, or, can, or is it still on double-secret probation? Well, they, they've released a lot of information there. This is a photo of the one of the three radios that was in the booth. 
It is going to be a tri-band radio that is 2 meter, 70 centimeter, and 23 centimeter. It's going to be all mode, satellite, and one of the one of the cool things that the guys in California that I was just out there last weekend were excited about is the radio has DD mode on 1.2. So ICOM has not abandoned that that mode. Uh, we just saw the back of the radio. One of the features that was added that I'm very glad to see them put on there is an external time base. It's right below the Ethernet port on the right-hand side of the screen there. There are two N-type connectors, one for one for 70 centimeters, one for 23 centimeters, and a 239 for uh, two meters. Uh, there's external speaker jacks on the back of it, pretty much everything that you would uh, expect to see on that radio, including the 13 bin DIN for other connections and accessories. The screenshot that we're looking at right now is the function menu. And one thing for those that have 7300, 7610s or seen photos, there's two different function menus on it. The very first one, you can see your commonly used uh, adjustments, transmit bandwidth, compression. It is a smart menu, so you'll have the functions for the mode you're operating in, so you don't have to go through a huge laundry list. The second function menu has not been fully defined yet, so I don't have anything to show on that at this point. So it's still under development. They were telling people that they hope to release it in Japan uh, by the first of the year. Now we're looking at the menu. Again, just like the function, you have two menu settings. And again, if you're in a particular mode, then you're going to have that functionality. This looks like it's going to be for sideband or FM. And you can see you have the voice, uh, voice icon as well as in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, the satellite functionality. So that, that is exciting about this radio. Uh, the second menu uh, is going to be showing you the DV modes, like the DV list, the call sign settings, call sign directory, gateway functionality, and the set mode. Now, the next photo is going to be a comparison, so you get an idea. Right in the middle is the, is the speaker. And I'm not really sure which radio it's attached to, but there you get to see the 7300 and the 9700 together. And it's been quite a few years since there's been what we call the twin side by side. Uh, that would make a nice uh, pair. The 9700 did create a lot of excitement. Gordo, I bet you recognize the guy there on the left-hand side. There's my friend yeah. Greg Cook, J JO's 3 slk He gets on a lot of D-Star and satellite. And we had Keith Baker, KB1SF, stop by. Then we also had the guys from the DV Mega development team. Goose is Papa Echo 1, Papa Lima Mike, and David, PA7LIM. Uh, both of them had to come by and take a look and see what all the excitement was about the 9700. And then finally, uh, the, the last group of uh, celebrities that came by was Adrian, K08 um, SCA, and what he's noticed, noted for is the D-Expedition in Somalia, 6 Oscar, 6 Oscar, which uh, Val did a nice interview of, and Adrian just got back from Germany from doing WRTC 2018. Again, Greg in the middle, and then a friend of ours, Lee, from uh, uh, VK land. He's VK3 Golf kilo so Ooh. that was that was one of the most exciting things we had a few sleeper items um, one of them was an artificial intelligence speaker project but this this was one of the sleeper projects right here it was it looks just like an echo an Amazon echo the first one is an icom artificial intelligence speaker and basically what you do is you command and control the radio through voice commands. Now, this is just a concept project. It is not scheduled to be incorporated. It is basically to give developers ideas of what you can do using the CI5 command. And 
Uh, nice shadow there from diamond antennas on the video, but it showed the radio switching to, to 10 meters. Then the discussion on how the, uh, the Amazon Echo works a little bit further in that video and where the voice recognition on the top of it, then the reply back of the command going through the internet and then again controlling the radio. One of the items that is in there is the is a Raspberry Pi box running an embedded software. Uh, we're hoping to see some white papers about this project and the development of this, but uh, there's no guarantees at this point. Uh, oh. Then the next item there again was working on the Internet of Things, and that is looking at controlling the ICOM R30. They introduced both iOS and Android apps to control the radio. A real short video to give you an idea of what the screen looks like. And uh, you could do basically everything on controlling the radio except for programming memory channels. Two other advancements that they introduced. One was the uh, IQ output on the 78 or on the 7610, and that allows you to have a fully SDR device without controls from the front panel, but using the radio itself. Very nice video on how to set it up by K0 PIR did a real good job, but this is the kind of screen that you would see from some of the other computer-controlled SDRs. The final item was the RSBA1 version 2 software. And there's two parts of it, and I was showing George earlier today why we were doing the, the testing for it. And I'm going to... Just one second here. Yeah, it looks like they've made some nice improvements to it. I, you know, I have RSBA1 myself. one myself. This, so there's this, two this, parts of the RSBA1. The ICOM remote utility portion of it that allows you to establish the connection. The radio that I'm bringing up right now that I'm connected to is actually at a friend of mine's house in Snohomish, Washington. I'm living right outside of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I tell it what radio I'm going to use, and you can either use a traditional 7610 with a single receiver, and it's telling me right now, or confirming with me that I want to go to a single channel. And then the display changes for the uh, single output look on the radio. So get an oh, idea, wow. we're looking at uh, oh, wow. 40 meters right now. I can change it to 20 to get an idea of the band activity. I'm using the remote control knob, the RC-28, to change the frequency. make adjustments to the noise reduction, put it in CW mode, and of course the signal would go away. So what I'm going to do is bring up the newest portion of it with the dual receivers. Takes a little bit more bandwidth, so I hope I don't drop out here. But confirmation that I want to use the two channels. Then make a connection to it. The screen does expand. It gives me two sets of controls, two tuning knobs, and two band scopes. Make the adjustments here so I don't blow everybody's speakers out. Okay, so that radio was not located there with you. That That's a remote radio you were controlling, right? That is correct. That was in Snohomish, Washington. 
And if you give me your your login information, I can control your seventy seven hundred. Yeah, well, not right now. <laughs> <I don't care. laughs> well, that you know, that's some nice stuff, Ray. Um, we're we're still waiting. Everybody wants to know more about that ninety seven hundred, but I know all the details are not there yet. But um, any any projections on when? We might know more or a uh, target release date or anything yet? Well, some of the rumors that I was hearing was the they were saying sometime uh, by the end of the year. I don't know if it was their calendar year, meaning that in December, or if they're talking about our fiscal year, which ends at the end of March. So December to March time frame for the Japanese market, we're hoping to see it in time for Hamvention. Wow, well, that, that is coming pretty soon then. Uh, the RSBA1, that that looks like some nice improvements to it there. Um, uh, you know, I've used it a number of times with my rig here, and it's, it's pretty nice. I assume it's the same thing there um, as far as connection. Uh, you, you just connect it right in. Uh, now, well, it, it depends... I, I, it, it depends yeah. on the radio that you're using, uh, 7610, 7700, 7800, 7851, and 7850 all have the Ethernet port. We saw the Ethernet port on the back of the 9700, so fingers crossed it'll all be through that port. Now, the older radios, or like the 7300, you will still need to have a computer to be the server, and then have a have the client installed on another computer as well so you'll need two computers for some of the radios yeah yeah well yeah uh and the ai stuff they're working on there that'd be nice if that ever comes to market i know that the um the handicap market or those needing accessibility would probably really like those features Well, the AI speakers in that are really cool, and there's a there's a lot of possibility uh, with that product. I I didn't see any details. In fact, the notes that we received was it's not being planned as an ICOM release product. It was more to show what is possible out there, and since it it's interfaced through the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's just using the CI5 commands that are open sourced and in the back of all the different radio manuals. In fact, the 7610 has its own dedicated manual that shows all the legacy commands as well. So that's one of the nice things about using the CI5 protocol is all the ICOM control, computer controllable radios share a lot of the same commands. Hmm. Okay. Well, Ray, we thank you for being with us tonight and, uh, you know, giving us a, a little rundown on what's going on there. I know it would have been much more exciting if you could have been standing there on the showroom floor witnessing all this. But uh, you came up with some pretty good resources there, like uh, like in a couple of hours, huh? Uh, yeah, it's been, been a little bit fast-paced today to get everything, try to make sure I got my talking points as well as the, the images that we could use. Yeah, well, uh, interesting stuff there. We look forward to learning more about it and um, and hopefully have you back here with us soon. All right, George. And by the way, your 7300's fallen asleep in front of you. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to wake it up, but I can't reach it. I hope we didn't right. bore everybody else like we did your 7300. Yeah, well, you know, it, it already knew all of this stuff, so. <laughs> All right, right. Seven three, man. We all uh, look for you soon. All right, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Gordo, what about that new stuff there? I think it's great. And you know, when um, Ray and uh, his team are ready to hook things up, <clears throat> of course, uh, it's going to go to coax cable. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And we're going to talk about something that I have never seen coax cable do before. And let's go to one of the four shots from Tracy WM6T. 
This happens to be some brand new coax cable that uh, Tracy brought on board from a leading uh, dealer. And um, <clears throat> this is an area of the coax that he got looking at after doing some measurements. And after the measurements, um, look what happened. That is the center conductor in the middle of this coax run that is shorted to the outside braid. Is that amazing? Shorted. Yes, worse. Normally, the center conductor is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven conductors all grouped together. But uh, after he hooked things up, all of a sudden, he couldn't believe what was going on. So the the bottom, thank you, Tracy. The bottom is, uh, and that's a good shot of Tracy, WM6T. He said, let, let's examine what it takes to double check a piece of coax because, of course, there's nothing worse than running your coax cable and finding that um, uh, that brand new roll of coax, maybe without PL259s, um, has a short. And I have never, ever seen a short that I couldn't tell from the outside jacket in a hunk of brand new coax cable. So Tracy, you are number one in uh, discovering that. And he used a um, VSWR analyzer to uh, figure out exactly, or almost exactly, where that short was. Now, when we buy coax, get it from a leading ham radio manufacturer. Coax on the left has a tough outside, non-contaminating, which means it's not going to leak in or out jacket or migrate into the braid. The center coax is is pretty uh, pretty um, bare of being 100% shield, which it obviously is not. And the right-hand coax was nice and shiny. But look at this, on VHF and UHF, your signals are going to literally leak out of that coax. Now, first of all, a good PL259 uh, is required. And when we talk about PL259s, we want one that the center uh, uh, tip of that PL is held in place with um, a uh, non-plastic type of um, uh, material. And when we go to solder it with that big soldering iron, we want to make sure and solder the center is easy. Uh, but uh, unless it has Teflon, uh, when you apply heat to the center, uh, it's going to migrate one way or the other way and possibly short out physically. But it's the braid that a lot of folks miss soldering well. They'll solder the braid, but the adapter, the UG adapter on the rear of that connector still can be uh, turned. And that means there's not a solid connection. So we encourage all of you, when you pull together your coax, ready to make sure that uh, you don't have any shorts. Yikes! Look at this. Yeah, that's a short ready to happen. Make sure and properly dress the outside braid down the side of the UG adapter uh, so that uh, you're not going to have any short uh, show up. And uh, while this one's a little messy, uh, this is a good connection because in trying to move the adapter at the very end, just before the black jacket, uh, it does not move. That tells me that we've got a good connection. Now, the other end of the coax, of course, at this point, you can go ahead and meter with a plain old ohm meter to make sure you don't have a short. And um, then when we uh, go ahead and get ready to put that on the antenna, you want to add coax seal and that comes out of uh, Universal in Reynoldsburg, uh, Ohio. And the coax seal is going to make sure that moisture doesn't get into the coax. Nothing worse than a uh, wet uh, coax cable. Uh, and there's the uh, connection. I still see a little area that uh, needs to be uh, uh, mooshed around so that moisture is not going to drip into the uh, coax connector. <clears throat> now, I like to look at coax cable with an analog uh, meter uh, in checking to make sure I don't have a short and I don't have an open. And uh, because you want to do that before you scale all the way to the top of the tower uh, to make sure that uh, you've got a good piece of coax and everything is hooked up uh, properly. 
yeah, maybe you've got a lift to help you get to the top of the tower. But there is nothing worse than uh, getting everything hooked up. You go down to your HF transceiver and you can't even pick up WWV. And by the way, I hope everybody signs that petition to keep WWV on the air. You cannot test a hunk of coax for continuity if you've got an antenna on uh, the end of it uh, or a, a ballon, a four to one or a one to one ballon. Some of these ballons are looking on a DC meter as a short to ground. So when you're checking your coax, don't be doing it with a uh, antenna uh, tied into it and just eyeball the coax. What do you see here? Well, this one showed up on the meter as uh, several kilo ohms of uh, conductivity because of the seawater that got into the jacket. And this is a common problem of the UV killing the outside jacket where moisture goes in. What I do is to check a piece of coax uh, even before Tracy, even before I uh, get it into place, is I'll hook up my analog meter, which we'll do in just a second and show you. And then at the other end, I will put my thumb over it. I usually lick my thumb and I should see one or two kilo ohms of conductivity between the uh, tip and the outside uh, barrel. Now, if I'm by myself and the coax is already run, Oh, yikes. How am I, what am I going to do now? And I've got like eight or nine cables uh, coming out of uh, the roof access hole. I'll attach via jumper cables, little tiny little um, uh, test cables, uh, a uh, electrolytic capacitor. And uh, as soon as I test the other end, I'll see the meter instantly jump up and then uh, rather rapidly drop to a open connection and that's the capacitor that is um, uh, taking a quick charge and then going to uh, almost uh, no conductivity and then of course um, once the antenna's on <clears throat> I'll use a MFJ or a rig expert uh, that's what Tracy was using uh, SWR analyzer and that analyzer will not only look at the coax for a good connection but also the antenna to make sure that the antenna is resonant as well. And anytime you are plugging in a coax cable and you feel that the little jack called an SO239 on the back of your rig is not real tight, you better take that rig apart and see whether or not the single connection to the printed circuit board off the tip of the coax connector is still on the circuit board or if it's broken. So if you got a loose one of these on the back of your rig, don't just tighten it up, say everything's fine, but rather go inside the rig, locate where the center conductor is attached to the board and make sure that you've got a good connection. And anytime that you are hooking up cable, look at that UG275 or 276 adapter. That is not screwed all the way in. And I bet right there by the black jacket, uh, I bet that if you go ahead and turn it, it's going to turn, which means that that is not a good solid connection uh, on the braid. So here's what, um, uh, and again, uh, there's no way of telling uh, ahead of time whether or not you got a good or a bad hunk of coax until you do a check. So what I do is I will hook a uh, electrolytic capacitor to one end uh, and then I will go ahead and uh, touch uh, the meter uh, here and watch what happens. You can see that it went up and down. I'll do it one more time. There you go. And that's showing me that I've got a, a good piece of coax cable. However, if on your analog meter, you see something like this, that's telling me I've probably got a piece of coax that is waterlogged and you don't want to use it. So normally people will say, well, you never measure, you know, coax cables and stuff with a ohm meter. But yes, you do when you're on the bench putting on the PL259. So make sure and get good PL259s, either ones uh, that um, uh, are about $2 a piece. Uh, they have either a phenolic uh, center uh, insulator 
or uh, in this one, Teflon. I like the Teflon because uh, that way uh, I can always see if I've got a stray whatever in uh, looking at uh, that connection. So before you go ahead and run your coax, put on the PL259s, hook a meter, R times, uh, in this case, uh, it's going to be uh, R times uh, 1K. My Simpson here is R times 10K, and that gives me a little better reading. Make sure that it looks like an open circuit. Then put your thumb over the other end. Maybe wet your thumb, and you'll see the meter go up and register maybe two to 3,000 kilo ohms uh, uh, resistance of your uh, wet thumb. And make sure that you wiggle the cable on the coax to make sure that it's good. And then again, double check that that UG275 or 276 adapter for the smaller cable is not turning. Because if it is, it means you didn't get enough hot solder on the outside braid. So that's my take, uh, George, on coax cable. So back to you for a little smoke and solder. Okay, Gordo. I have never seen a worse looking piece of coax there. <laughs> Me neither. And, you know, George, I tell people I have never, ever seen a shorted piece of coax, brand new coax, without some evidence of heat or something uh, that's going to pretty well tell me that I've got a short. And that's the first time Tracy has ever seen it, yet it came from a leading manufacturer. So, wow, I don't know what happened there. Yeah, <laughs> obviously something didn't go just right there. Well, thanks for bringing us more information on uh, coax there and uh, some tips on how to check it and make sure that things are right because it's real important. And a bad coax can just ruin your day, if not your rig and everything <laughs> else. Well, I've, uh, I've got a website tonight I just wanted to mention. We're running kind of long, so... I just wanted to bring up, um, well, yeah, that's not what I want to bring up, is it? This right here. Uh, this is Nightfire Electronic Kits. Uh, you can find them at vakits.com, and you'll find Nightfire at a lot of ham fests. The reason I thought of them is because they were at Huntsville this year, and I stopped by their booth there and picked up a few more kits. You know, if you're just getting into electronics or experimenting, this is a good place right here to find a lot of kits that uh, they have put together. And they've got them right here handy. So you can just search through and find what you might want. I've looked at a few here. It's, uh, you know, if you're into Arduinos or just wanting to start with them or maybe a little advanced in them, there's a lot of good things here. They've got uh, cell phone remote controls, uh, using Bluetooth, uh, very inexpensive. I think I'm going to pick up some of those and do a little playing with Bluetooth and my Android phone. Um, they've got all the uh, models of Arduinos as well, individual Bluetooth modules there. And you know, on the Arduino, there's a chip on there that you can easily blow out. It's the AT Mega 328. And I've actually damaged IO pins on there before by connecting things wrong. Well, for $2.99, you can get one right there. It already has a bootloader on it. We'll just plug right into your Arduino Uno, and you're back to 100% there. But they've got a lot of other stuff on there, too, like uh, some audio amplifier kits. If, if you want to build a little audio amplifier, learn a little bit about constructing analog circuits, lots of things right there. Uh, those Silver mica capacitors that we use a lot in uh, RF circuits, they've got a good assortment of those right there, too. A ghost detector. You never know when you might need one of those, although I've never needed one myself yet. <laughs> Obviously, someone must because they've got several models to choose from there. And ham radio kits. You know, they've got the um, Pixie QRP kits. Uh, and a variety of uh, different bands there, code practice oscillators, uh, radio programming cables, you know, uh, uh, a nice assortment of ham radio kits, and those toroid call, calls that we use in a lot of kits. If you're wondering where you can pick those up, well, they've got them right here in a variety of different mixtures. Yes, the mixture is important when you're building 
a project there. You want to make sure you're using the right mixture for that project. So here you go, a lot of variety. Now, I don't see the bigger ones in there like we'd use for, um, say, a 100-watt ballon, but the ones that you'd use on your little QRP kits, it looks like they have a full assortment of those there. So there you go. That is Nightfire, uh, Nightfire Electronics. I always visit them when I'm at a ham fest that they're at because uh, there's always something there I want to pick up. And I've got a few more from them when I was in Huntsville. We'll be maybe looking at some of those here in the near future. But, you know, last week uh, I had a question for you here. Since I'd just been to Huntsville, I wanted to know what is your favorite ham fest? And I just took a random number there and pulled out a winner here. It's James Gilmore, KK6FGH. And James said that his favorite one is Pacificon. Well, no way you can go wrong with Pacificon. That's certainly one of the better ham fest out there. So congratulations, James. We're going to uh, have MFJ send you one of these MFJ 148 RC radio control clocks. It's a dual clock. You set one for your local time zone. You set the other side for UTC. It can display 12 or 24 hours, and it's got a 10-minute ID timer in it. Exactly what you need for your ham shack. So uh, MFJ148RC. Thanks for that, MFJ. Next week, well, I'm going to give away one of uh, Gary Drash's books. It's the Ham Radio is Alive and Well. We've talked about this book before at Gary Drash, K9, DJT. He had been out of amateur radio for a number of years. Came back to see if it still existed, and yes, it does exist. And he learned a lot about some of the newer things that we're doing today and some that uh, he really didn't know existed. And he wrote all about them in this great book, Ham Radio is Alive and Well. If you'd like to win that, well... I know Gordo was here tonight, so I'm not going to give away another one of his books, but I'm going to sneak in there and get a question out. Uh, this one, by the way, we'll be covering on Ham College this Thursday night. It's from the general pool. Which of the following applies when selecting a frequency for lowest, in a, for lowest attenuation when transmitting on HF? Is it select a frequency just above the muff? Select a frequency um, just, excuse me, let me just start all over on that. I really messed it up. Yet. <laughs> Which of the following applies when selecting a frequency for lowest attenuation when transmitting on HF? Select a frequency just below the muff or select a frequency just above the luff. Select a frequency just below the critical frequency or... Select a frequency just above the critical frequency. What's your best way to uh, select a frequency for the least attenuation when transmitting on HF? If you think you know the answer to that, send it to me, hamnationcontest at gmail.com. And uh, Gary may be sending you one of his great books here. Well, we'll be back in just a moment, but first let's get a message from ICOM. Heard it, worked it, logged it. It's time to get the transceiver that's best suited for your lifestyle. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products. See how you can make the most out of contest season with these transceivers. The competitive edge you've been looking for, raise the bar and hear what others cannot with this flagship HF 50 MHz transceiver, the IC7851. Reciprocal mixing dynamic range, crystal clear local oscillator design, spectrum scope, dual receivers, and digital voice recorder. The IC7610 is the SDR every ham wants and just in time for contesting season. This high performance SDR has the ability to pick out the faintest signals even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The new ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling software defined radio that will change the world's definition of a SDR transceiver. RF Direct Sampling 110 RMDR Independent Dual Receiver Dual Digicell 
IC7300 is changing the way entry-level HF is designed. This high-performance innovative HF transceiver with a compact design will far exceed your expectations. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Register to win some great swag prizes like t-shirts and hats while you're there. Learn how you can win in the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. For August, that's the ICOM ID 51A Plus 2 VHF UHF dual band dual watch D-Star portable built-in GPS extended D-Star coverage. It's got terminal mode, access point mode. DV, fast data mode, DV and FM repeater search function, and you can download the RSMS 1A Android app for free to go with it. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this and each episode of Ham Nation and register to win. Sign up, good luck, and don't forget to follow Icom America Inc. on Facebook and Twitter. And another radio you could win is this one that's sitting right here below me. It's the ICOM IC7300, we're going to be giving that away as part of the 13th anniversary celebration of um, Amateur Logic. It's our uh, 13th anniversary contest. You know, we shot our first episode right around the time of Hurricane Katrina, and uh, we've been at it for, for quite a while now. And we want to thank ICOM for bringing us this radio to give away to some lucky ham. Uh, we've got the MFJ uh, this is the, what is the number of this thing? MFJ 4230DMP. It's their new switching supply, small, handy supply here with a uh, digital display on it. Uh, we've also got 50 foot of coax that MFJ's given us. And we've got the MFJ Big Stick antenna here. I, you can't see it because it's a 17 foot long telescopic antenna. And my camera won't look that high, and I don't have a 17-foot ceiling in here. It's got the uh, coil on it uh, that you can adjust from anywhere from 40 meters to 6 meters with the combination of where you tap that coil and how high you extend the telescopic element there. And it's got the L-bracket mount on it. And I've got some other great prizes to go with that as well from Heil Sound. We've got the Heil ICM microphone right here, uh, designed specifically for earlier ICOM radios, and of course it works great with this one as well. Push to talk button built right on it, and it's got the connector to fit ICOM radios. And the new Heil BM17 headset right here. It's a Bob's emergency communicator headset. It's painted yellow there, so you'll certainly be able to find it in your go kit when you go looking for the headsets. It's got either an electric element for uh, working with ICOM rigs, or you can get a dynamic element with it. Your choice, it's available with either a single ear cup or dual ear cups right here. These are very comfortable and lightweight. They'd be easy to wear in, um, in a long-term situation where you're going to be operating on the air. Not necessarily just for emergency communications, but they'd be great for contesting as well. And we're going to throw in something else because, you know, you might not be, you might not even be a ham. Well, you got to be a ham to enter this contest, but you might not be a general yet. Or you might want to upgrade to extra. We're going to give you uh, your choice of uh, one of Gordo's books here, a general or extra edition. And uh, get you studied up and ready to get on the air with this great rig and prize package here. To learn more details on that, go to amateurlogic.tv slash contest. You'll get all the details right there. You'll learn how to register and um, what's required. Uh, so uh, thanks, ICOM, MFJ, Howl Sound, and Gordon West Radio Schools for making that contest possible. And uh, do go enter if you haven't already. If you already have, don't enter again because it'll disqualify you, but... Uh, Somebody's going to get a nice package here coming up, oh, middle of October. And now it's time for the wide, wide world of ham radio news with Don Wilbanks. 
Hey, thanks, George. Before we get into that, I want to tell you something that happened uh, cool last Thursday night. Uh, I was invited to uh, a club meeting in New Orleans, suburban New Orleans, in uh, Jefferson Parish over in Metairie, uh, of the Jefferson Amateur Radio Club. And that's the club that Bryant Rascal, KG5HVO, our current 2018 Young Ham of the Year, uh, started his ham radio career in. And they invited Bryant to reprise his Huntsville uh, WRTC through the eyes of a youth uh, contest operator uh, a forum that he did there at Huntsville to do that presentation via Skype for the club members. And they invited me to come along, too, and I got to uh, stand up and talk a little bit about Young Ham of the Year and Bryant and Amateur Radio Newsline and Ham Nation and a whole bunch of other stuff. And then they surprised Bryant and me with, uh, with these. This is an honorary membership to the Jefferson Amateur Radio Club, and I was completely and totally taken by surprise by this and shocked and honored and just as proud as I can be. They're good folks. I've known those guys for, uh, well, as long as I've been a ham since 95 and, uh, really, really pleased to be, um, to be an honorary member of the Jefferson amateur radio club. They are a VEC by the way. So, uh, if you're in the new Orleans area and you need to take a test, they are your local VEC and uh, they can get your stuff uh, your license stuff processed extremely fast. So looking forward to doing field day maybe with them here uh, coming up uh, later on next summer. Anyway, so thanks again to the Jefferson Amateur Radio Club. Just uh, a great time. And uh, yeah, you'll you'll see me hanging out there a little bit more often, I think. Uh, there you go. Yep. Jefferson Amateur Radio Club. Whiskey 5 Golf Alpha Delta. Good folks. Really, really good folks. And their, their clubhouse was totally and completely decimated by Katrina. They had feet and feet and feet of water over there so anyway they're back and they're strong and uh, it's a good club let's go ahead and get into the news of the week now from amateur radio newsline and we'll have a solar update from amateur radio newsline report number 2130 these are the ham nation headlines for wednesday august 29th 2018 First, a programming note, Amateur Radio Newsline presented the Bill Pasternak Young Ham of the Year Award to Bryant Rascal KG5HVO at the Huntsville Ham Fest, August 18th. We don't have time in this report to bring you that, so please listen to the full five-minute wrap-up segment in this week's report. And you can hear the entire 25-minute presentation on the extra page at arnewsline.org. As we in the U.S. were watching Hurricane Lane affect the Hawaiian Islands, hams in India were dealing with their own weather disaster. In the southern Indian state of Kerala, the region is reeling from what is being called the worst flooding in almost a century. Hundreds were killed due to overflowing dams and more than 300,000 people had to be evacuated to relief camps. Meanwhile, amateur radio operators throughout the region began providing HF and VHF operations for local and more distant district offices, according to a report by emergency operator JU for U2JAU. A report in the Times of India said that in Kerala alone, an estimated 120 ham radio operators had been deployed to send messages of medical aid or to report the stranded. They passed messages to assist senior district administrators for handling evacuations and getting provisions such as medicine, food and water to evacuees. State officials said relief camps at one point were housing in excess of 800,000 people and were struggling with sanitation and other issues. In one of the district's hardest hit by the deluge, 1,000 residents were feared stranded. As waters began to recede a few days later, some residents had been permitted to return home, but the crisis was expected to continue for some time to come. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jeremy Boot, G4NJH. Cuts in the U.S. government's fiscal year 2019 budget are threatening WWV and WWVH. Dave Parks, WB8ODF, Newsline's newest correspondent, has the latest. Hams have been petitioning Congress to retain the funding for WWV, which received its call sign in 1919, assigned to the National Bureau of Standards. It's considered the oldest continuously operating radio station in the U.S. Likewise, WWVB, broadcasting from Fort Collins, Colorado, is also imperiled as its critical role in keeping tens of millions of radio controlled clocks and other devices in sync as it has since 1963. As reported by a number of news outlets, the petition has until September 15th to collect the needed 100,000 signatures. News sources have noted that defunding both stations would reduce the federal budget by $6.3 million, a very small fraction of 
the proposed $4.1 trillion budget. Amateur Radio Newsline is making available the link on our website, arnewsline.org, to the online petition for those hams that would like to make their views and voices heard. You'll find the link on the printed version of this script. For AR Newsline, I'm Dave Parks, WB8ODF. Meanwhile, the United Nations is returning to the airwaves. The sounds of silence are about to end for 4U1UN. This isn't just the amateur radio club of the UN, but a DXCC entity in its own right, and it's been off the air since 2015, transmitting only beacon signals. When the UN headquarters building in New York City was renovated, the new layout did not provide room for the club's station, which was formerly located on the 41st floor in the annex. Restoring a shack to the club has been buried in red tape. The club's president, James Sart, K2QI, told DXWorld.net, The station 4U1UN, which was formerly K2UN, is the 34th most wanted DX entity. Sart said that the club is looking to restore operations on the grounds of the UN. He told DXWatch.net, quote, that equipment was recently donated to the club that will get it back on the air and that a transceiver, amplifier, and networking equipment are now in place. He said an antenna will be installed and tested perhaps later this month and things are beginning to look optimistic. He told DXWorld.net, quote, I promise that 4U1UN will be back on the air soon, end quote. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Andy Morrison, K9AWM. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at ARNewsline.org. With Jeremy Boot, G4NJH, Dave Parks, WB8ODF, Andy Morrison, K9AWM, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wellbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now here's the solar update with Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. We're coming down from one of the largest solar storms of this solar cycle, and we'll talk about how it affected amateur radio and GPS during Hurricane Lane. And a new active region has emerged on the Earth-facing sun, and it's got even more scientists saying, hello, solar cycle 25. Those stories and more in the news this week. Space weather this week has gotten outrageously busy. We had a filament eruption that launched an Earth-directed solar storm, which really didn't seem like it was all that big a deal when it launched. I mean, it was moving extremely slowly. We knew that there was a finger-like coronal hole that opened up afterwards, which might send us some fast wind on its heels. But still, we really thought its slow speed would make it, eh, you know, kind of a ho-hum kind of storm. But its slow speed was the magic ingredient because when this thing hit Earth, it just kind of stalled and it like stormed and stormed and stormed for so many hours. Sounds kind of like Hurricane Lane, doesn't it? And this thing affected amateur radio, it affected GPS, and I'll get more into that later. And it became one of the top five storms of the solar cycle. Now we're calming down from that, thank goodness, but we will have some gorgeous aurora all over the world to show you a little bit later. But this isn't the only story. We have a new active region that has emerged on the Earth-facing disk, and at first we weren't really sure, but it, this is yet another region from the new solar cycle. And what's more is that this region hasn't kind of gone back down under the surface. It's actually rotating to the backside. So we're going to be watching it very carefully on the sun's backside, and who knows, maybe it'll emerge back on the front side in about two weeks. Now, the good news is amateur radio operators and emergency responders, we do have a new region that is rotating into Earth view here on the sun's east limb here in the next couple days. So solar flux will probably stay at the top end of poor, maybe even the low end of marginal over this next week. Switching to your m -flare threat meter, you can see the X-ray flux continues to be extremely low and therefore by proxy the solar flux is low. Now right around the 24th and the 25th we got a boost in the X-ray flux just a little bit. You can even see some B-class flares popping. That was from the emergence of the new region from solar cycle 25. It grew really fast and it gave us a nice boost to the solar flux for a few days which really was perfect timing because it helped amateur radio propagation stay up just a little bit during 
during this uh, horrible solar storm that we just went through. But then it kind of stabilized and the flux died a little bit. And since then, those two regions, that region and one other one, have rotated to the sun's backside. So we're once again back down to the high end of, uh, mar or of, of poor, maybe the low end of marginal. But we have a new region that's going to be rotating into Earth view in the next day or two. And it might boost the solar flux up just a little bit more. Switching to our solar storm conditions, we had been hovering between unsettled to active conditions, basically from some small pockets of fast wind and a little bit of mini solar storm action, and then BAM! See that on the 26th? That was the solar storm. Whammo! We went up to a G2 level and then a G3 level storm. This hit hard and it wiped the amateur radio bands, especially the, around the frequencies that people were using for emergency communications for Hurricane Lane. And we had, count them, 21 hours of straight storm level conditions, which is awful when you consider how much was devastation was going on in Hawaii right now. I was a nail biter the whole time. Since then, things calmed down a little bit. Then whammo, we went right back up into storm levels when the fast wind hit that followed this very slow solar storm. Luckily, since then, things have calmed down and it looks like we can finally say it's all clear. Switching to your solar storm conditions, what a difference a day makes, folks. After that incredibly intense solar storm, everything is in the green. We're expecting unsettled conditions pretty much everywhere. Now, at high latitudes, NOAA is giving us about a 20 to 25 percent chance of a minor storm. And this is because Earth's magnetic shield is a bit conditioned, and it just doesn't take very much to get it rattled since that big solar storm. So you might still see some aurora sporadically here and there at high latitudes latitudes over the next couple days. Now, mid-latitudes, we're only expecting about a 10 to 15 percent chance of active conditions, and things should begin to really settle down here as the week progresses. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, after all of the activity, we are finally back to a spotless sun. This means we have no risk for any big flares or radio blackouts this week, which should make you GPS operators happy. And we are sitting at the marginal level for radio propagation right around the low end of marginal, which should make amateur radio operators and emergency responders a bit happy. Even better news is that we actually have a new region that's going to be rotating into Earth view here in the next couple days, and that could boost the solar flux up a little bit more to get us a little bit higher into that marginal range, hopefully, and these conditions should continue easily for the next week. So the space weather this week has been incredibly exciting. We're just now coming down from a massive solar storm that was actually one of the strongest solar storms in this current solar cycle. And it could have spelled disaster had Hurricane Lane made landfall in Hawaii. On top of that, we had an emergence of an active region that we weren't quite sure at first, but it is confirmed it is an active region from the upcoming solar cycle. And it's got scientists thinking, hmm, maybe solar cycle 25 is going to come sooner than we thought. Now, since then, that region and another have rotated to the sun's backside. So we're back to a spotless sun, and that should make GPS users happy. We also have a new region that's going to be rotating Earth's side here in the next couple days, and that should boost the solar flux into the marginal range, even higher into the marginal range that we already have. So that makes radio propagation uh, do a little bit better, so amateur radio operators should be happy. And that region's flanked by a couple small coronal holes, which could send us some more fast wind here in about two weeks, and that should make aurora photographers happy. I'm Tam with the Scove. Thank you for watching. Always good stuff from Dr. T. Make sure you follow her on Twitter for uh, the absolute latest. And again, check her out, her, uh, her full report. You'll find that on spaceweatherwoman.com. You can also find it on her, uh, on her Facebook feed and also on Newsline, Newsline, on, uh, on Facebook and on YouTube. That's what I'm trying to say. All the information is on her Twitter feed. She'll have an extended solar report that has a lot more detail in it than uh, what you just saw here. Uh, just for uh, for time's sake. But uh, anyway, WX6SWW, Dr. Tamitha Scove. Uh, so happy to have her on our team and happy to have her as a ham now, too. So good stuff. Now let's uh, transition over and see what's going on with viewer videos and Dan in 9LVS. Well, good evening. How are you doing this fine evening? I don't know. Um, what have you heard? What have I heard? I've heard I got a lot of videos in the in the queue 
Thank you. Um, I asked a few weeks back about uh, if people wanted uh, to send in their videos on camping and I uh, got a few good responses. And uh, let's go ahead and see the camping video. Let's start out this edition with Kirby Scott, KC9 QFH. Here he's testing out his camping setup, which includes an Alinco DX70. And off in the distance, you can see a Wolf River coil antenna. The cabinet itself is actually made from scrap lumber. Andrew M6GTG has the Azu 857D that he uses while camping, as well as an M0CVO antenna and a Sandpiper 3-element Delta Quad. Amar K9CHP has an ICOM 706 operating from his Winnebago, as well as a Buddy Pole Deluxe. Roy KG8EK uses an ICOM 718 hooked to an ICOM AH4 antenna tuner. From there, he just goes to a 4-foot piece of pipe, and that's his camping setup. Lynn NG9D has a pretty unique setup. It's a 50-foot long doublet supported by three 12-foot long telescoping aluminum poles. Tom KC9ECI has a pretty neat setup for JT65. It's an ICOM 706 hooked up to a signal link and that's connected to a laptop. Nothing like doing JT65 portable from your campsite. And for my little setup I used an ICOM 718 and a Kenwood V7A. The 718 was connected to a Wolf River coil antenna, and the V7A was connected to a dual band mag bone antenna. And that's it for Show Me Your Shack Camping Edition. Well, that shows you a little bit of what's going on with the campers. About a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I got uh, a message from uh, a group that's actually on Facebook. Uh, it's called Ham. RVers and uh, went to their website and took a look around and uh, put up a little post. Uh, hey, if you want to send me your RV uh, can or RV videos on how you're set up in your RV, uh, go ahead and send them. And I got deluged. Um, and uh, we put together a nice little video on on uh, the uh, different RVs that we saw out there. This is Show Us Your Shack RVing style. Let's start out this segment with Steve, AG2AA, who spent a little time at Kyoke State Park in New York, running a G5 RV and an ICOM 7300 from his campsite. James, N01PC, RVs from his Airstream. His rig of choice is the Elenco 635, hooked up to a dual band antenna on the roof. Jeff, KC0NIB, uses an apartment antenna run up on a pole. Dan, N0INF, and his wife Debbie, N0CSI, did a little hamming from their RV in Shelby, Montana. They're using a Kenwood 480 and a Flex 6600 in their RV. Bob, N7BUW, uses an ICOM 7300, hooked up to an MFJ 1965 push-up pole. Looks like he's pretty much set up on 40. Paul, W9PJ, runs a pretty simple operation to hook up his inverted Vs for 15 and 20. Uses a couple of fiberglass military push-up poles hooked up to the RV ladder. From there, he goes to inverted Vs for 15 and 20 meters. He also hooks up a three-element beam for 6 meters on the top, letting the inverted V act like guy wires. Larry, WA5NFT, took out his RV, and operated portable from Abilene State Park in Texas. He set up a 20-meter inverted V between a few trees, and it worked just fine. Scott, KB9AMM, and his wife Jill, KB9PZF, have this nice setup in their RV. It's a Kenwood TS2000. They're constantly going between Hamfest to Hamfest. They are Tower Electronics. And just this past weekend, Aaron, K6AMS, and his wife Susan, KI6LWW, just visited this past weekend Hart Bar National Forest in California, near Big Bear Lake, which is some 6,852 feet in altitude. They had quite the setup running. A couple of dipoles up, 
running to the back of their RV, and they were even running solar power with a 120 watt solar panel. The rig they used was the KX3. So let's have Aaron tell you a little bit about his system. Good evening, everyone. This is Aaron, K6AMS, and I'm doing a little FT8 here at our campsite on the back of our RV on our little porch. I've got the laptop going in our KX3, and we have a Pectena wire going out to a fishing rod out there, or a fishing pole, rather. You can barely see it off in the distance. And I'll show you the moon coming up over the mountain. So we're having a good time catching some contacts. 73s. I'd like to thank the people from the Ham RV's website on Facebook for all the help in setting up this segment. And with that, 73 from N9 LVS. Well, that's a pretty neat video. Uh, different ways to set up in an RV. RV, the biggest problem you got is you got very little space, so you find any crook and cranny you can come up with. Um, got one more video. Uh, Tom and uh, Joyce Crowley sent me a video of uh, basically a tour of their RV. Now let's get to that video. This is KD0TLJ and KC0VII. Hello. He's in the back filming tonight. And welcome to our shack. Uh, we'd like to show you around our motorhome. We have a Jayco 23 foot Class C. We'd like to show you a few radios that we have in a motorhome. The first that one that we have is a Kenwood 700. It does two meters and 440. And our next one that we have is a 10 meter rig that we use when we go down the road on that. And up here we have a few that we have. We have our Johnson radio that runs UHF. Next to that we have a radio shack that is for public service. And next to that we have our Yezu uh, FT991A radio that we run with the Addis 120 antenna on that, and it is connected in the back on that. And up here, we have a computer that we use for all our digital use and also for all our contacts and stuff that we have. And we hope that we can hear from you soon. Again, this is KD0TLJ and KC's... K KC0VII. KC0VII. We'd like to say seven threes to you, and we'd like we are coming from from Pooh Bear that we call our motorhome. Have a great evening. Well, thanks, Tom and Joyce. Uh, that was a great video. If you have uh, video or pictures of your shack, we'd like to show them on Ham Nation. Just send them to Ham Nation Videos at twit.tv hamnationvideos at twit.tv and we'll get them on as soon as we can and I believe I'm tossing it back to Don Don, what's uh, what's new on the agenda? Anything else? Oh, we're going to Amanda Okay Hi, and I have QRM in the background uh, <laughs> Thank you, Jeff he, comes, he doesn't talk to me all night He has a question as soon as I'm on the show um, Wow Hi, Ray <laughs> Hi, uh, George. Hi, Gordo. Nice to see you guys tonight. Great segments, by the way. Before I get to any yeah. questions, I do have um, one very awesome announcement. This is breaking news, by the way. Valerie in V9L is running for central director, central division director. So I hope anyone that's in that division is going to look her up, check out her views, see what she's going to bring to the ARRL and go out there and vote for her. Um She's she serves in a tremendous way. And yes, I might be campaigning for her a little bit, but she's my sister here on Ham Nation. So I think it's my right. Not to mention she is the DX queen. So uh, I hope everyone goes out there. Check, check out our Facebook page, too. Um, all right. So, Ray, I do have a couple of questions for you on the 9700. One Ray's comes from Joe. With... What? Ray, Ray's not with us. He, he uh, dropped oh. out a little early. <clears throat> Okay, that is, that's too bad. All right, that's fine. I can come up with some other things here. Um, okay, the Bo the Boxboro, Massachusetts uh, ARRL convention is September 7th, 8th, and 9th. 
And one other thing I do, I do want to say this though, when Ray was talking about the ICOM speaker and what would be some of the possibilities for it, some people on chat room came up with some interesting uh, protocol names like HRIP, <laughs> Ham Radio Internet Protocol, HOIP. I can't wait. I, I, I ran outside to Jeff who was on the patio and I said, this is our future. I'm going to be able to make contacts from the shower. I guarantee it. 20 years from now, that's what we're going to be doing. Um, so that's kind of fun. Anyhow, uh, Gordo, I did have one question for you. Somebody felt really bad about the coax that you were showing and they wondered, where did that coax come from? Where was it purchased? Um, I don't have the details on exactly which dealer, but it was a prominent dealer, and they, too, were so surprised that they uh, gave Tracy, the buyer of that coax section, uh, a very nice certificate for future products, plus they replaced the bad uh, coax. So uh, that's the benefit of dealing with a ham radio company. They immediately back it up. But I don't know the brand name of the coax. Okay. And also Brett from Wyoming, I believe it is. He says, be sure to mention the Wyoming High Plains Roundup and Statewide Convention. I'd love to, but I don't know when the date is. So you guys might have to Google it and check it out. Um, and who was showing something hey, on the screen there? Hey, Amanda, real quick. Yes. Brand new coax, like Bordo <laughs> says. Brand new coax, bad. Um, was setting, this, setting up a, a system for a buddy in his apartment. And uh, we purchased all brand new coax and this one put it on the antenna analyzer and then actually I checked it with my um, uh, scope as well. And bad piece of coax right out of the box. Wow. <clears throat> you know what I can say the most? Um, Jeff works a lot with repeaters here uh, on <coughs> mountaintops. And Dan, you your video is so funny. They're up all the way in 6,800 feet. Well, we live in 5,300 foot altitude here. So that's, that's like nothing. Anyhow, Jeff goes up to these 12,000 foot, um, repeater sites all the time. And what's the biggest problem? The patch cables. That's, that's always what it is. It's always something got water, got into it, ice, it froze over. Um, even here at home, actually, a lot of times when we get SWR on our antennas, when we're trying to work HF, it ends up being the patch cable between your bus bar and to your antennas. So check those things out first. Don't try to tear down your antennas first. Um, I don't think I have anything else because I had gathered so many questions for Ray. I'm really sorry, everyone. One thing I do want to say is a very, very happy birthday to Sarah Heil. Sarah, um, I hope you're having a wonderful time in Hawaii with Bob and we're so glad to be celebrating your birthday tonight. Let's see. That's pretty much all I have. I'll just do the net announcements next. We have 14 Charlie for D Star. We have Echo Link on Do Drop In. We have TAC 311 for the DMR net. And on HF, we have 7192 for the 40 meter net and 14268 for 20 meters tonight. So everyone is home and not working the, the wildfires. Steve, uh, he W7UDI, he has been on so many fires lately. He hasn't been able to run most of the nets. So thank you, Steve, for what you do out there. And uh, glad you could be running the net tonight. With that, George, I hear you're wrapping it up tonight. Okay, Amanda, thanks for being with us. And nice antennae. I yeah, guess. thank you. <laughs> ears, maybe ears. <laughs> they're like, they're um, like panda ears. Panda. Okay, I was thinking a yeah. cat, but uh, a pink panda. No, they're panda. not. They're not pointed. So. Oh. Okay. I turned into my tiara to become a panda. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, before we leave, let's run around one more time and uh, see if anyone's got any last words. Uh, Dan, anything final from you? Yeah. Uh, we're, uh, getting ready to do a, another segment. I do have some regular, regular shack videos where it's either in the house or in the car. Um, so I need a couple more videos, send them, send my way or pictures and we'll get those on as quick as we can. And where would they send them? Ham nation videos at twit.tv. Okay. All right. Thanks for being here tonight, Dan. Always fun to visit with you. 
Gordo, any final words of wisdom for this week? No, I hope to work folks either on 20 meters or 40 meters. I got the 9100 all warmed up, so we'll be listening in about a half hour. Okay, we'll be listening for you too. Uh, well, thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, another fun episode. I am not sure. I believe Bob will be back with us next week. And, uh, hey, we'll have more then. And for me, uh, I'll be doing the next time college tomorrow night, 8 central at live.amateurlogic.tv. We're covering the general pool there. And, uh, hey, jump on in. Even if you've already got your license, it's good to review some of this stuff. Uh, we have people in the chat room answer the questions as we go along, and they don't always get them right. So not not a bad idea to review every now and then. Well, thanks for being here. Join us again next week at the same time for the next Sam Nation. Until then, 7-3.